but you only have one shot in this game. Like, if you buy a piece of equipment and it actually fails your meeting, you will never trust it again. Mm -hmm. So as a result, uh, customer first is a huge part of the culture. Welcome to another episode of Outside the Valley, a podcast by Art, the remote hiring platform that helps you hire remote software engineers and teams easily. I'm your host, Jovian Gautama. Today we have Max McKeith, the co-founder of Owl Labs, the company that created the Meeting Owl, the 360 degrees smart conference camera for remote teams. In this episode, we covered how their flagship product, the Meeting Owl, was created and the struggles Max and his co-founder faced in the early days of Owl Labs. We also talk about the unique challenges of building a hardware startup, how Max uh, prepares for and runs meetings, and his learnings faced when he was still the CEO of Owl Labs. So Max is not the CEO anymore. He's currently like the head of product of Owl Labs and leads everything related to the product development. Um, this is the first ever episode that we recorded live in the ARC's office, so the audio is noticeably different. If you're enjoying the podcast, please do consider leaving a review on iTunes. And again, if you have any feedback or if you have any guesses that you think should be in the podcast, feel free to re- email me at jovian at arc.dev. It's J-O-V-I-A-N at A-R-C dot D-E-V. Without further ado, here we go, Max McKeith. Hey, Max, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Right, so Max, so let's just get started with the basics. Um, can you share a bit about your background, your career, and how did you get yourself into learning robotics in the first place? Sure, so um, my background really didn't start off in engineering. Mm-hmm. I didn't really have a care for that. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened for me was that when I was going to college, I had to pay for it myself. My parents weren't helping. Mm-hmm. And so when a lot of people were pursuing their passions, I was thinking about the cost of education and right. how fast I could pay back my student loans. So um, I realized I was pretty decent at math and I figured I would go after electrical engineering because a lot of my uh, friends in school were afraid of that uh, uh, career path for some reason. So it felt like a good challenge. Mm-hmm. So I went on to study electrical engineering and in my third year of school, I realized that I actually had no idea what an electrical engineer does. Um, I realized that I was very good at solving math problems, but I imagined that work was not somebody coming to you with a problem set and then expecting an answer in the morning. Uh, So I became a little bit worried that I wasn't sure what I was getting into when I graduated. Um, As I was entering my third year, I uh, the, the thing I would always do in class is I would uh, walk up to the professor on the first day and ask how I can get an A in their class, what were the habits that, that would result in an A. And so I did that and one of the professors in my digital logic course, really, he said, you know, I really like your energy, how would you like to stop by the robotics lab um, after class and then uh, I'll show you around and see if you're interested in, in participating. I said, sure, I had nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. So I showed up in the lab and you know, for the first three weeks, they had me solder cables together for programming these little robots. Um, it became super frustrating over a period of time, but I wasn't the only person there. There were like three or four people with me, but three weeks later, I was the only one left. Oh. And so at that point, they let me do more things. They gave me my own passcode to the lab. And um, in that lab, I started to see how these master's students were programming these little robots, these TJ, they called them TJ robots. and. I started to realize the power of engineering right then and there, like the ability to use sensors to sense the world, to then make intelligent decisions based off of those sensor inputs. And I I never looked back. When I graduated, I knew that I wanted to be in robotics. And so the only game in town was really iRobot Corporation. Mm -hmm. So I packed up my car. I was at the University of Florida for my undergraduate, undergraduate degree. Packed up my car, moved to Massachusetts, and started working at iRobot Corporation. Um, it was iRobot is the first mass market consumer robotics company out there. They have sold millions and millions and millions of uh, Roombas worldwide, right. and they continue to innovate in the space of um, a 
autonomous home care. And they recently, I think, announced a uh, robotic lawnmower product as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a big brand, a lot of love. I joined pre-IPO. I met my co-founder there at iRobot in 2004. Um, and funny thing about him is uh, he didn't like me when he met me at first. <laughs> And then just a few weeks ago, he got married, mm -hmm. and I officiated the wedding. Oh, okay. I married him and his wife. So, right. So that was your main co-founder. So um, you were in your, your co-founder uh, were colleagues in iRobot, in the Roomba. And how did you guys get into creating the uh, meeting owl? Sure. Yeah, so uh, my co-founder is a brilliant roboticist, and uh, my background sort of, I, I started to focus on electrical engineering, and then I went into people management, and then I went to product management, but he was always focused on algorithm development, sensing, mm -hmm. and uh, higher level intelligent algorithms. So in about 2010, he decided that um, he wanted to experience startup life, okay. and he left iRobot Corporation, I stayed, and he joined a startup called uh, Remotive Corporation. And um, that company was based out of Vegas, and he was not going to leave his life in Boston to move to Vegas for the mm -hmm. startup. So they agreed that he would work remote. And so for three weeks out of the month, he would work in Boston, and for one week, he would travel out to Vegas to meet with the team. And back then, when he started, this was the, um, we're sort of entering the world where Google Hangouts it makes it super easy right. for people to communicate over video. Um, it's embedded into your calendar link. And so for him, he was surprised at how effective he was being a remote employee uh, with Google Docs and, and those types of tools. Right. So one-on-one -on -one conversations were super easy, but what he realized was that he wasn't adding very much value in group meetings. Whenever he would join a group call, he couldn't see everybody in the room, he couldn't hear people, and if you can't see and you can't hear, you can't understand. And that's, the, that's where he first realized there was a problem. Now, uh, one day during the meeting, um, in, during one of these group meetings, somebody started to rotate the camera of the person speaking to help him see. Yeah, yeah. And this was the epiphany. This was the moment when he realized, well, we can automate this. So he flies back to Boston and we go out for a couple of beers and he starts telling me about this problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, holy crap, you know, this is something we can really do something mm -hmm. about. If there's anybody in this world that can solve this problem, we can do this. Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, we had the iRobot background, we can build hardware, I had been the product manager at this point, so I understood what it takes to structure a profit and loss statement, and like really put a business case around a product. Mm -hmm. And so it was a no-brainer decision that in 2014 we quit our jobs to start this company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great story. Like everything is falling to pieces, right? Because if, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people have been in your, uh, in your co-founder's uh, position before, but only the right person with the right background can get that epiphany. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to the listeners now um, what is your product, The Meeting Owl? Sure. Okay. Yeah, so our labs is about uh, empowering remote teams to communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. And it's a big problem, it's a growing problem. Many people identify it themselves is. as mm -hmm. working as in a remote team. Mm -hmm. um, so what we built is the Meeting Owl, which is a smart 360 degree camera, 360 degree microphone array, and a 360 degree speaker. And all of this is packaged into a single device called the Meeting Owl, and uh, we embed a lot of intelligence into it. So we use computer vision techniques and acoustics techniques to fuse the sensor data to be able to identify people as they speak in the conference room. So if one person speak, we cut them out of a 360 view and show them automatically. If multiple people speak, we put them side by side together. Right. And all of this intelligence is embedded into the owl, so all you need to do is plug in a USB cable from the owl to the computer. There's no drivers to install. Uh, it is automatically recognized by every operating system on the market and it works with Zoom, with Hangouts, GoToMeeting, pretty much if you're a small company or even an enterprise, we can plug into whatever you're using. And if you switch what you're using, we'll come along with you. Yeah, yeah. for the listeners out there who listen to this in Spotify or in your podcast player, you probably cannot see this. If You can go to our YouTube channel to see um, the Owl Labs right in, uh, in front of us. Um, so I personally can vouch for our last because we here in ARC is a hybrid team. Uh, other solutions are just sucks and it really helps us uh, a lot. So yeah, go check it out. And if you're listening on the podcast, check the show notes. Um, it will be an Amazon link. Okay, I want just <laughs> directly to the, to the company. Uh, 
product uh, page, but the Amazon link, so you can just uh, one click buy it. Oh, thank so, you very much. <laughs> cool. It's an Amazon affiliate link. Mm. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, I can get more money. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but so this is the uh, the meeting owl that we know now. But what was the very first prototype uh, looks like? Yes. So the very very first prototype was um, actually a, a Python script that. So we tried mm -hmm. to make a very lightweight prototype. Mm -hmm. We we took and recorded a. Um, a scene. Okay. We, we, my co-founder Mark and I, along with a friend, we acted out a meeting experience, mm -hmm. and we recorded three cameras, and then we used the Python script to cut the, cut ourselves out of the video recordings and kind of animate them together in mm -hmm. the way that the meeting gal animates meeting experiences today. So that was the very first prototype that we made, and it was wholly insufficient for raising money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we did actually struggle a little bit to get the initial rounds of funding, mm -hmm. but once we got some angel investments, we started to really focus on building a physical prototype. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, the 0 0.1 prototype was amazingly, um, it was a Frankenstein uh, product. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, it was a combination of an Odroid computer, right. uh, which was, we plugged into it a... Um, image sensor that we sourced from uh, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and in twenty, and we were also hot melting on top of that a fisheye lens. Mm -hmm. um, and so the funny thing about those prototypes was that um, because of the hot melt, as the longer it ran, the la less focused it became because the weight of the lens was sinking into the image oh, sensor. Right. So you started to lose focus. We also put in some microphones in there and. Um, and, and this was the very first thing that we built, which was um, a product, it, it was not compatible with any conferencing platforms, mm -hmm. but what it did really well was identify a person that was ah, speaking, showed them automatically, put them side by side, and one, um, we had a pitch for Y Combinator where uh -huh. we actually took this prototype to. That pitch was horrific, <laughs> horrific. I mean, we you only get 10 minutes to Pitch Y Combinator for $120,000 investment. Mm -hmm. And so, number one, it's hard to get selected. We were selected. We flew out to California. My co founder dragged a monitor in his backpack, and I brought a 12 foot extension cable. We brought this prototype. We had all of 30 seconds to set up. And as we're setting up, he's struggling to find the power outlet. He wraps me up in the oh cord, and I'm like, my voice is starting to break as I'm trying to tell these folks what mm -hmm. we're all about. He plugs in the prototype, it hardly works, and then of course, sure enough, we get rejected. But on that same trip, we ended up showing this prototype to our uh, seed round investor, mm -hmm. Playground Ventures, and they got it right away. They understood what problem we were solving. They understood the value of IoT in the conference room, and so they made that initial investment off mm -hmm. of this sort of hot melted together, 3D printed um, Frankenstein of a prototype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so after that, okay, now you got the investment, how do you go about finding the, uh, the early adopters, the customers? Mm -hmm. And can you share a bit more about the process was like and how did they, uh, the feedbacks there? I can literally rephrase that. How do you go about uh, finding the early adopters and then uh, what's your process in gathering mm -hmm. feedback from them? Sure. So um, hardware is very hard, it's very expensive to build, and so Super. you have to really be careful about the decisions you're making. You want to validate as much sure. as you can, as fast as you can, but unfortunately it's a kind of a catch-22. You can't test it until you build it, and building it is very expensive. Yeah, so yeah. how do you... Unlike software, like yeah. you can like, A-B test, like you can't really A-B test hardware, it like, takes months. It would be yeah. impossible. Yeah. And so for hardware specifically, um, the first thing I, I wanted to make sure was that I understood, I had a view on what the market is, Okay. right? And so um, for us, what based on industry research, which you Google your way to finding it and you look at mm -hmm. products in the same space to see what, how they think about it, uh, we've identified that there were something like 40 million to 60 million conference rooms available to us to serve. So if you multiply that by the $800 price point, which is what we sold the meeting out at, you know, it's a huge market opportunity at 100% penetration. So um, yes, lots of space to grow into. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the other thing I started reading at the time was the reviews for things like pan tilt zoom cameras that okay. are remote controlled. Mm -hmm. So they're USB pluggable cameras, just like the meeting owl, except the customer is given the remote control to steer the camera ah, in the okay. right direction. 
and unanimously uh, what people loved was the idea of having a remote control so that they can focus the camera on the right place but um, they struggled with a number of problems for example there was a lot of motion blur when that oh, camera okay. is being yeah. steered physically steered um, it, it sickens the people on the remote yeah, end. I can see that. Um, there's this sound that it produces, the gearboxes fail, so there's all these problems. But, but the point was that the desire for con camera control in the conference room was there. Hmm. So now we had to understand, is it actually a product worth um, acquiring? So uh, what I did was I bought seven of these products, these remote controllable right. cameras, and um, I wanted to test to see what is the value. Uh, does the meeting out have value in the market? So I bought seven of these cameras, and then the next problem was I got to find people to test this with. What I learned early on was that um, when you're a startup, no brand, no market, no product market fit, nobody wants to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And um, especially in your case, because it's kind of like a high price point you know, compared to software. And even before we even built anything, right. they don't want to talk to you because yeah. what's the point of wasting their time on mm -hmm. like a startup? Hey, I'm a CEO, a two-person company. <laughs> talk to me. That's right. it's just impossible to get attention. So what we ended up doing was um, networking, talking to people, I being see. introduced. Uh, there's nothing stronger than someone making an introduction mm -hmm. for you. And so through this process of networking, as well as stalking people out on LinkedIn. Um, what I realized was we had really good um, fit with startups, meaning that startups were willing to work with us. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of that has to do with just empathy. They right. understand what, why, it, and it's hard to start yeah, a company. Yeah, they know the pain, yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. and so they want to be helpful. And you know, I wanted to give them, regardless of whether or not the company succeeded back then, mm -hmm. at least the people who were willing to work with me would in return get this you know, $500 device that they could use for their meetings. Right. So their makeup was that their company, they're a hybrid team, um, and they have video calls using Skype or Hangouts or Zoom even. And so we identified through this process, through this recommendation process, seven companies that were willing to talk to us. And I gave each of them this competing product, uh, well, future competing product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this product, it's sold by Logitech. It's called the Conference Camp Connect. It's shaped like a Pringles can mm -hmm. of chips, mm -hmm. and it has a camera, microphone, and speaker built into it, and it's USB pluggable with a remote control. And so I, I sent it out to these companies, and every week I would conduct interviews with them. Oh, wow. And so the first interview was about the out-of-box experience. What's that like? What did you struggle with? What did you, um, you know, what did you not like? And so there was some really interesting learnings there. So I made really good notes about right. you know the right for the, the things we should be incorporating mm -hmm. into our out of box experience. Um, and then the next thing was you know everybody unanimously agreed that they loved the USB cable because it just plugs in and True. works easily. And then as they unboxed it, what they told me was they loved the idea of a remote control. And I asked why, and they said, well, because then I can control the view of the camera for the benefit of my remote people. So I said, in my mind, I'm thinking this is great, but we've got to prove to ourselves right now that, you know, we have to understand whether or not the remote control is um, a net adder or a net, net subtractor in the conference room. So as time goes by, what, um, and I'm interviewing people, they, they love the camera, they love the, the ease of use, but they stopped using the remote control. And I asked, you know, why did you stop using the remote? And they said, I just don't have time to mess around yeah, with the I hardware. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, especially when you're leading a meeting, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Who's got the time for, exactly. for, you don't want to think about technology. You want to think about the conversation. And so what they started doing instead, because this thing is shaped like this Pringles can, mm -hmm. is rotating the, the Pringles can. Yeah. It's a lot easier. It's mm -hmm. a lot faster. And that was a very strong sign to me that there's a lot of desire to show the right thing at the right time, but not a lot of will to do it in the meeting. Mm -hmm. So automation, we felt like, would really solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And so we felt like we were on the right path. Right. Um, the last question that we wanted to answer was whether or not meeting owls should have batteries in them. So that way they would be portable. And the thing that, um, so this product from Logitech actually had a battery inside of it. And we were on the path to putting a battery into the product. And as I was interviewing the companies, one thing I learned from one of them was that um, they had a client call that lasted something like three hours. Mm -hmm. And they kept the conference cam camera off battery. And during the call, in the startup, during the call, the camera died. Oops. And they never trusted it off battery again. 
And then I said, you know, what's the point of burdening the customer with the cost of adding a battery um, when they're eventually not going to trust it at yeah. all, right? And so we made the product decision that we're not going to put a battery right. inside the Mini right. L. And, you know, so through this process, we developed what we call the MVP, minimum viable candidate, but we, the, the, the cost was $3,500 and my time. So instead wow. of building all that hardware, we just acquired a bunch of proxy technology that we can test with customers and sort of learn. Now we learned the periphery of what the product is, but we had to build it to actually mm -hmm. understand what it, what it has to be to satisfy customer needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, it's super interesting. And also because uh, our lab is the very first hardware startup that is in the podcast. So I specifically want to ask, um, which I think a lot, most of listeners don't have, especially if they're starting out, they don't have a most experience in is finding suppliers. And this is super challenging, especially especially if you are, uh, you know, based in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And usually the best suppliers are uh, in the Asia for uh, different factors, you know, uh, quality, sometimes cost and whatnot. And how do you go about finding the suppliers right now? Can you take us through the process, starting from, you know, doing the research mm -hmm. and then probably meeting them? Sure, uh, absolutely. So uh, we were fortunate in our case, well, number one, I have personally a lot of experience with uh, Chinese manufacturing mm -hmm. specifically, oh, okay, yeah. and iRobot manufacturers, um, this is public knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. Jable and a couple of other suppliers. So I at least understood um, who the players were that right. uh, we could reach out to. So I, I suppose in some sense I had some built-in knowledge about yeah. this. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if I had none, I would just go back to the same thing, which is networking. I Meet see. people and try to get the introductions and then get on the plane and travel. Uh, meet them face to face, form a relationship, give them the same sales pitch that you give your venture capitalists. Um, because you, you want a partner. Uh, that's exactly. really a partner at the yeah. end of the day. They need to have confidence in your business. Um, they need, and, and a lot of that confidence is going to come from you and mm -hmm. your ability to, to show conviction in, in mm -hmm. your business plan. Yeah. Now, the other thing, we actually went to, a, we manufacture with Foxconn, and they're not a, a supplier that I've ever worked with in the past. And um, there's, through our investors, um, we got connected, we were connected to Foxconn through our right. investors. Um, and so that was also helpful. But again, this is sort of, we networked our way to our investors, who mm, then yeah. we, we said, hey, we need to be able to manufacture right. this. What do you guys recommend? They connected us to somebody that um, had an opinion, and uh, we were choosing between Flex, Tronics, and Foxconn. Right. And we ended up going with Foxconn because camera was going to be one of the key value props. Foxconn manufactures the mm -hmm. uh, Apple products, of course. Uh, so what better place to go than Foxconn? As well as scale, you know, if you go to a tier three supplier, I think it's a fine thing to do, but just know that um, your process at the end of the day is the thing that produces reliable product and hardware. Mm -hmm. I mean, processes, we rely on it everywhere. You guys rely yeah. for, for like how you interview can totally. folks. We, we rely on process for product development and manufacturing as well. And Foxconn is, um, they have an amazing process. The process scales, it scales across regions. So it just felt like if we're going to truly be a global brand, mm -hmm. we need to partner with global, manuf uh, capable global manufacturers. Yeah, uh, I really like uh, that you mentioned that it's from networking because it's just like everything else, like you know, hiring employees, referral is the best thing, mm -hmm. especially you know, finding suppliers. Uh, bro. And also like that you say that you actually give them the sales pitch, even though you're a supplier. I think most people, if you're experience, you have this misconception, these suppliers need me. But sometimes it's like you mentioned, it's a partner, right? Because these suppliers also need to make sure is this client worth it, just like in every business. That's a uh, fantastic insight. Now I'm going to uh, get still still around the, uh, the use case of the OWL lab. So, it's very obvious when it comes to the hybrid teams like like us and our you know when like right say five people is on the same meeting room and our five people is remote then you can use this mm -hmm. and it can bring the the feel of togetherness using all of it. but um, what about the hundred percent distributed team where uh, no one is um, co-located mm -hmm. um, 
have you had customers with that uh, use case before? Like, how did they use it? Because in my mind, like, correct me if I'm wrong, because I feel like if everyone has a, mm -hmm. an outlet, that's kind of like a huge cost. But yeah. I'm just curious, like, what was the, um, how did your customer use outlet if they're 100% distributed? Sure. Well, uh, so um, the short answer for that is 100% distributed team does not need a meeting owl. Yeah. And um, a meeting owl is more for the use case you described. It's an investment into your team, okay. into communication amongst your team members. Um, do you guys use Slack? Yep. Great. Yeah, we do as well. Mm -hmm. And um, do you use, what, what's your video conferencing platform? Uh, Zoom. Zoom? Okay, mm -hmm. we do as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies so, look like yeah. us, right? So um, I'd say that there are other tools out there that will make 100% distributed see. companies extremely successful. Mm -hmm. But going back to the Genesis story with my co-founder being remote and struggling to participate, yeah. you know, they brought him as a senior robot assistant in group calls. He can't give his his insights. Right. Um, that's where we really shine. But um, there are times when, um, so for me personally, um, I don't dog food to hundred percent distributed. Mm -hmm. We have an office, and then we have people. We actually have folks in China. We have mm -hmm. people in California, all over the U.S. And when I'm working remote, usually um, I'll just, um, through Slack slash Zoom, somebody that I want to have a conversation mm -hmm. with and we have a quick one-on-one -on -one chat. Um, whenever there's a video call, a group call though, I want the meeting out there because I want ah, to yeah. see people's reactions. I want to see who's not happy with the meeting, who's attending the meeting, who's, who's participating and engaged. Mm -hmm. um, do I need to follow up with anybody, right? There's this, um, there are social cues that tell you more about the person's uh, perspective than you can ever get through yeah, their yeah, participation, right? And so you need to be able to have those insights and it's almost impossible to have them without yeah. having something like a meeting gal on the group call. So 100% distributed, I would not recommend a meeting gal. Mm -hmm. I'd recommend an investment into headphones. I would recommend an investment into uh, Zoom. I think they're a very uh, good and reliable conferencing platform. And Slack, of course, for that asynchronous communication. Right. Uh, but not a meeting gal would not make sense. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned about the, um, you know, seeing what uh, the social cues for people are because I just yesterday I was uh, I listened to a podcast episode uh, I, I forgot the uh, the podcast Lizette Sunderland we, uh, she was interviewing your VP of marketing mm -hmm. Rebecca Corliss and she mentioned that she got very good at like you know reading the social cues through, through meeting owl that she can say oh are, do you want to say something and it's, it's a really smaller cue yeah. and she also mentioned that sometimes she got it wrong and no I was just you know um, yawning or just stretching or something like that. So, so that, that's very funny. Yeah, and Rebecca is a, yeah. especially empathetic. Empathetic. Ah, I see. Uh, this is what makes her such a great marketer, mm -hmm. in my opinion, that she just really can easily put herself right. into the shoes of the customer um, or even the person she's speaking with. Mm -hmm. So I have no, I, I believe 100% <laughs> that that is exactly what she does, which is try to extract as much value out of those meetings as possible yeah. through those social cues. Right. There's also like, so a while ago, I interviewed the um, VP of engineering of uh, Help Scout. Uh, they're all 100% distributed. And she mentioned that this point that I never thought before, basically um, working remotely or working with remote people actually kind of train you to be more empathetic in all situations. Mm -hmm. Like I will assume like once you, you know, we think all you get better at writing social cues and uh, she also mentioned that um, on her team, she got, you know, when they have a very, you know, established company culture and process, and one of the uh, core values they have is like be more empathetic. Mm -hmm. And she feels like, oh, now I can always assume good intentions with my coworkers, you know, on Slack because remote. And she also felt that it also um, transferred into her daily life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's super interesting because, uh, sorry, it's probably a bit of a tangent, but... Oh, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's right. I find, uh, so there there's levels, right? So right. The, the least empathetic form of communication is just messages, it's mm -hmm. like Slack, yeah. for example. Sometimes um, it, it's very ambiguous. You can yeah. lead to confusion. A very quick reply may come off to the person reading it as um, just offensive at, at yeah. times yeah. you really have to kind of go the extra mile to be verbose and uh, provide context if you want to have a good slack message but that's not what slack is for okay. 
Then the next level is video. I think video is extremely high fidelity communication yeah. where you can see the expressiveness of a person mm -hmm. and have good communication. And then, you know, we're social beings, so there's nothing uh, like a face to face conversation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't teleport yet, but the meeting gal, <laughs> we, I like to think of the meeting gal as helping to bring the room to the remote people right. in a, when they can't physically be there. Mm. The, um, how do the internal meetings, are there, is there any other unique cases from your clients? For example, um, have you ever like, you know, give meeting hours to their clients, like mm. use this when you mean it's much better, something like that? Yeah, so there's um, there's been derivative use cases for sure. So for example, um, there are focus groups that like to use the meeting out. Mm -hmm. um, so focus groups are groups that okay. kind of talk about a product or a concept. It's their marketing studies. And typically in a focus group, you have a camera that sits behind a one-way mirror mm -hmm. and they record the conversation. And then if you're the decision maker, you get this kind of a flat recording of the output of the meeting. Uh, but we find very big companies actually using meeting owls in their own internal focus groups. I see. And the benefit is that since owl focuses on the person's face that's speaking, when you when you give that video summary to your decision makers, mm -hmm. they're actually seeing the face and the oh, expressions yeah. and that, that empathy. Of, they're establishing that empathy with the customer. So that was an interesting use case. Another one um, is in education. So there's one that I'm thinking about where um, an elementary school contacted me um, telling me that there's this student that they have um, who cannot physically be in, co in classrooms because um, she has a deficient immune system and just the slightest cold can possibly mm -hmm. lead to her death. And so it's a sad thing and what they do is they wheel in a uh, cart that has a video camera attached to it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the field of view of that camera is fixed. So when the teacher walks out of the field of view, the student can't see uh, the teacher. And then um, the student never sees the rest of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So with the meeting owl in there, um, the meeting owl splits the view automatically. Right. So it will focus on the teacher. And then if there's questions being raised this, by the students, it'll focus on the students. Mm -hmm. And it gets a very unique use case, but it solves a, uh, this kind of empathy problem Got it. Um, or mm -hmm. connection problem for the student. Yeah, that's actually uh, super fascinating. Um, yeah. So I want to move on to the Owl Labs organizations uh, itself, uh, Owl Labs as a company. And how, how big are your team is now? So we are just under 50 employees. Under 50 employees. And you mentioned that you also have a team members outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And what countries are they? Yeah, so currently we have uh, employees in China. We mm -hmm. have two employees in China. Uh, and then we have lots of employees peppered all across the United States. Mm -hmm. I think we're over 20, somewhere between 20 and 40% remote. I don't recall the exact statistic. Mm -hmm. We have people, in, our CFOs in California, ah, okay. our um, uh, customer support is all over the United States. We have engineers, both mechanical and mm -hmm. software, all over the United States. So we really dog food this problem of remote work. Right. And the benefit is that, um, well, there's a couple of benefits. We, we just recently uh, released a uh, state of remote work, our mm -hmm. third uh, survey of what it's like to be a remote employee or a part of a remote culture. And what we find is that companies that support remote work tend to have happier employees. Yeah. And a lot of that has to do with your ability to strike the work-life balance. I right, believe. exactly. So like your kid is not feeling well and you need to stay home. Um, that's totally okay. If you want to travel and work in a different region mm -hmm. and enjoy like the, you know, the Colorado Rockies, but right. but still not not worry about leaving work behind, you can totally do that in our company. And I think that's something that people are experiencing more and more on a global level. One of the interesting statistics out of this report that I find is that uh, people who um, companies that support remote work, their employees feel more trusted because you have oh, to trust yeah. them, right? Exactly. They're doing work remotely. Yeah, you yeah, have to trust yeah. them. And so they're less likely to want to leave than companies that don't support remote mm -hmm. work. Um, yeah. So all over the all over the uh, my my hope is that one day we'll have employees all over the world. Right. Yeah. So, um, so let's go about meetings. So this is very um, very meta, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That the meetings inside the all apps. Um, so you know, I one of my uh, guest here on the podcast is CEO of a software company called Toggle. Mm -hmm. um, they're a hundred percent distributed team based in a Estonia. Um, great, it's a uh, you know time tracking software usually for freelancers and whatnot. So when I was doing research for that episode, and I found that CEO Christopher Hoff wrote a blog post about how to have five killer meetings. 
okay, and, and this is cool. And I realized that blog post is written in 2006. Mm -hmm. But if I realized, okay, if this blog post is um, published yesterday, it's still relevant. Mm -hmm. Now, I was thinking like, now imagine if product development or uh, programming didn't change for 13 years, right? Yeah. There'll be riot now, but why is when it comes to meeting, there's not so much innovation. Like, yeah. and we have our life, this one of it, and probably some are like Zoom mm -hmm. and Google Hangouts, but it just feel like things uh, can be done better. And uh, when you start, you know, scaling your team as uh, as a co-founder, pre previously you were a, the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're focused on the product, product roadmap and growth. Um, how do you prepare for meetings? Let's start with that. How do you prepare for meetings? Sure. So it depends on the type of meeting. So okay. if it's a sync up, uh, generally it's a my. I try to focus the meeting so that way it finishes on time. Right. I don't want to waste our employees' time. So uh, it's on me to make sure I'm aware of the time, but also that we're getting as much useful information out of our employees mm -hmm. for the benefit of everybody in the group, and we identify things that are follow up uh, opportunities. So for sync up very light preparation. There are other meetings that I have, um, for example, I, um, a, a, along, of, along with product, operations is a key component mm -hmm. of delivery, and so I run a sync up meeting with our operations group every Monday morning, and there I actually prepare notes before the meeting right. to talk to my agenda topics um, to share with the team, and then we have a conversation about these things. At the end of the meeting, I always write up a meeting note summary, right? And that is so that way we have is it a. This record. for every meeting, right? It oh, depends. Product operational. My goal is to. Um, this actually is related to where you started for. My goal is that every meeting that we have at Out Labs has a notes has has notes at the end. Right, of it. right. So that way we can track things and not yeah. You know. But the reality is, it's it doesn't happen. Huh, and okay. why is that? Well, people follow a bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Some of them are extremely good at note taking, and others are extremely bad at it. And, but I think universally everybody agrees that taking notes is important yeah. for all the obvious reasons. And so this is a place. And so you ask the question like, why is the why why are the the uh, suggestions in that blog post still relevant today? Well, because we still struggle with the same problems today. Yeah. And I think whenever there's a struggle, there's an opportunity. So the mm -hmm. opportunity is to apply some technology to make mm -hmm. these things work smoother for you. And one of the, so my goal with some of the products we're working on is to enable the entire company to take notes um, efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of them. Uh, my goal is to enable the entire company for for meetings, not sync up meetings, but for proper meetings to actually have an agenda. Mm -hmm. And the way you do this, it comes down to process. Right. And I think you can try and hammer process into people, but it's a not everybody will take to process. True. So I think technology that is seamless can actually embed process into your team. And I, I start there. How do we make technology um, useful in such a way that we can get to these meetings where you have agendas, where you have notes, and move the company forward in terms of its productivity with regards mm -hmm. to meetings? And that way the blog posts sort of go away because that's a um, very arcane way of doing yeah. it you've substituted those for technology. Right. And the technology is process and process is standardization um, and that's repeatable and scalable. Got it. And how about all hands meeting? Um, because I think every company has their own way to do all yeah. hands meeting. I think my question, do you still do all hands meeting now or is it your uh, current CEO do this? And what do you talk about in the uh, all hands meeting? Because it's a huge meeting. Yeah, so we have a couple of meetings. So there's the all hands. We also have a little lunch and learn where people can volunteer to share some information okay. with the entire company. It's a good way to engage our remote employees okay. and also kind of share, uh, you know, a little bit about what these different functions do. For the all hands meetings, um, generally, so that is set up by our CEO Frank, mm -hmm. and we kind of go through at a high level, give a department level summary of what's going on. Um, there's a it's 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 a standing uh, or it's an understood agenda that we're going to cover the different areas of the business mm -hmm. and give people a chance to ask questions I during see. that meeting. Um, so that's a little more. It, it's it's free form in the sense that 
we encourage our employees to ask questions, but it's organized in the sense that uh, Frank wants to cover very specific top of mind topics. Mm -hmm. That way we keep the entire company going and aligned. Mm -hmm. um, what, was, what would be your like number one advice for uh, uh, founders or CEOs if they want to be better at meeting, especially when it comes to like facing the entire company? Yeah, yeah I think um, game it out a little bit sort of write down what you want to cover and uh, anticipate the sorts of questions that people are going to ask and prepare your answers for those questions. Uh, I think if you want to have smooth meetings and your, your job is to get organizational alignment, it's part of the job description, you mm. know, being prepared, uh, sharing your message, and uh, you know, don't be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll follow up. Mm -hmm. and, and do it because you want to have a culture of accountability. Got it. Um, let's talk about the uh, company culture in Owl Labs. When you s started out the start to scale the company, uh, it was just you and uh, Mark, your co-founder, and then you, you grow. Um, what was the culture you were trying to set, or what was the culture you were setting in Owl Labs? What kind of companies that you're trying to build in, yeah. on, the high, on, the high, on the high level? Mm -hmm. Of course. So, um, remote remote work is sort of a byproduct of, of, of what we do. Yeah. Um, but the culture that I was trying to establish, um, one was customer first. We aren't building solutions just so we can claim to have the first AI thingy. Um, we are building things that customers will value and will uh, reward us with uh, revenue mm -hmm. for. Um, so if you think about the meeting owl specifically, um, people are putting it in between themselves and their customers, right. in between themselves and other employees. And so that's a lot of trust that they give us. Mm -hmm. Trust that the technology is going to work, trust that, you know, that we're going to be reliable. And you only have one shot in this game. Like, if you buy a piece of equipment and it actually fails your meeting, you will never trust it again. So as a result, uh, customer first is a huge part of the culture. Another one, um, being a hardware company, I always stressed, um, you know, one day that we would be profitable. <laughs> because, you know, unlike, my belief was that if we build a product that customers value, then we should be able to, in time, build a business that is profitable, that we can reinvest back into the business. Mm -hmm. Our customers will will buy the value that we offer them and allow us to reinvest that money back into the business. And so, um, as a result, you know, that's where I started, which was making sure customers are always at the center of everything you do, mm -hmm. and that's top down in the organization. And of course, making sure that you're building product that are wanted, that way you can have a sustainable, profitable future mm -hmm. in, you know, in the, in the end of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, when you were a CEO, yeah. and what were the biggest um, learnings that you learned along the way, like from starting from day one, and yeah. then you realized, okay, let's think about it as a general advice to mm -hmm. the uh, uh, startup founders and CEOs out there. So uh, you were a CEO for how many years? Four uh, years? Four years. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you share a bit more of the learnings that you had? At that? Sure. It's um, a great question. So. I think leadership by example is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, when you're asking your team to do what feels like the impossible sometimes, you need to be right there in the front of it and mm -hmm. working with them to do it. So we had a lot of issues getting out of manufacturing. Uh, it was okay. extremely difficult to get um, this system to a, a repeatable manufacturable state. And I remember, um, just struggling a lot to try and get it out of the factory and into the market. We we launched the OWL and almost immediately went on back order. I had recorded 40 apology videos to customers oh, that were wow. sent out. You recorded videos? Yep, we recorded. <laughs> Rebecca recorded videos of me apologizing to customers, explaining why we couldn't fulfill their orders. For, for, for four months we were on back order. So it was a beautiful thing because on the one hand, you're having a lot of success with sales because customers are buying one and they come back and want to buy more. Right. But on the other hand, you can't fulfill the orders because mm -hmm. you can't build them fast enough. And so I remember like I 
I love my team. Um, they traveled so much to China, leaving their mm -hmm. families, spending weekends right. trying to get out of manufacturing. And I was right there with them. At some point, I started buying one-way tickets to mm -hmm. China. I just refused to leave until we made wow. substantial progress. Mm -hmm. So leadership by example is a big one. I think if you're gonna ask the team to do the impossible, you've gotta be in there doing the impossible mm -hmm. with them. I think treating people, um, just trying your hardest to be transparent. It's really hard. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, is you don't have infinite funds in a startup. And so you're always balancing optimism with realism and like being transparent with people as much as possible mm -hmm. with um, how the business functions, how money is being spent, right. uh, what your runway looks like and what you're doing about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, trying to keep people, um, you know, don't, don't, don't shield them from the journey. Mm -hmm. um, help them understand and answer their questions as best you can and give them the feeling that you understand what the problems right. are and like you're working towards solving them. So those were the early day problems and then I think um, Work closely with your board. This was something that, mm -hmm. um, honestly, it's something that I wasn't good at. And I only realize now in hindsight with having brought Frank on board that this was a thing that <laughs> right. I, if I want to do this again at scale, I mm -hmm. should learn how to do that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I always, I think I sort of view it like I have a pretty good idea what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Especially and when you have the, the knowledge, like you, you literally, are, we're building the robotics thing, mm -hmm. and then yeah, absolutely. And we knew what the market was. Yeah, we we knew what channels we had to be in to be successful. We had a great team, um, but you know, I think I think one of the things that um, I would recommend to anybody, including myself possibly, is uh -huh. that if I ever do this again, I would join a CEO group, and mm. you just kind of like the benefit of it is that you will sort of see what other people struggle with. You'll learn that. Uh, you know, you don't know all the answers. That's right. the truth. Mm -hmm. You just have to have conviction in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But I think what you'll learn, uh, how do other CEOs cope with these things? How do they manage the board? How do they manage their company? How I do see. they manage themselves? Um, these are the sorts of things that you don't, you should not be alone in. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, the few pieces of advice I would right. give to a new CEO. Yeah. So for the um, you know the transparency about the you know the current runway of the company is this also covered in the all hands meeting? Yeah, so that's a perfect place for it mm -hmm. to be covered, right. um, of course. And yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I want to get back to the uh, so recently, our apps just released the twenty nineteen remote work report, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get to that a little bit. So one of the interesting conclusion that I found there is about. Um, the results are basically remote. It says remote employee managers are most concerned about a reduced employee productivity, like 80% of yeah. them, and reduced employee focus and lower employee engagement, satisfaction, and whether the remote employees are getting their work done. So these are remote managers that hasn't been remote trained, so mm -hmm. to speak. Right. Um, so the numbers are really high, like 82% uh, of them are concerned about employee productivity. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to you is that when you start building, the, uh, you start hiring remote people, have you ever had similar concerns? Yeah, so I never did, and part of this has awesome. to do with my experience at iRobot Corporation. So mm. even though back then I was only managing one remote person, um, the one thing that I told everybody on my team was I don't care if you work 20 hours a week, and I don't care if you work 80 hours a week. I only care that you get your work done on time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the expectation I set with everybody. Um, it's you're right to point out that it's a management problem, that the fear of product loss of productivity because you can't see people working. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so therefore, why don't you, not you, but like generally speaking, ed learn how to be a better manager. Exactly. The skill set that you need to manage remote employees is not the same skill set that you need to manage local employees. Mm -hmm. And there are some really basic things that you need to, I think what, what you should start with is identify the values. What is the thing you value? So in my robot example, I valued on-time delivery of product. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that kept our economic engine going. Mm -hmm. I'm a f big believer that engineering feeds marketing and sales and feed, yeah. that feeds Especially if you're a hardware startup. Right? Oh my God, totally, <laughs> totally. Yeah. And so if, if um, so, so what, is, what is the thing you value? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and explain that to your team. And um, I think at the end of the day, oftentimes it's going to be schedule. Mm -hmm. And so 
set the expectations that you mm -hmm. know working remote is okay. You should do it. Um, let me know when you're doing it if right. you really want to know that. But at the end of the day, the way I'm going to judge your performance is based on your ability to deliver to schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so so engage your employees. Don't be afraid of them. Right. You might have the management title, but you're just a human being like they are at the end of the day. So learn how to work with other humans mm -hmm. to achieve great things, and I think your employees will respect you for it. Right. Yeah, that's a great answer. So still about the remote work report, and uh, for the listeners out there, you can find the, uh, the link on the show notes. Um, another thing I find interesting is that the report uh, doesn't only focus on tech startups, you know, because I feel like, especially when you kind of talk about remote work, we, we're kind of living in our own bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remote work is possible, but yeah. what if you're a dentist? It's actually not possible, right? Um, so yeah, um, it's interesting on the mobile report, it also um, covers industries like, uh, basically their survey respondents work in uh, industries like healthcare, you know, legal, something like that. Um, it's just kind of deliberate or? Yeah, I think some, some industries are better positioned to uh, leverage remote work mm -hmm. than others. Yeah. So they're... There are there are cases where so for example, um, uh, whenever I get on the, on calls with our lawyers, mm -hmm. it's usually a phone or video call. Right. I rarely go downtown Boston and like to the twenty sixth floor of their very expensive yeah, fancy is, building. It's already expensive. Enough. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's yeah, it's absolutely. <laughs> lawyers are extremely expensive. Uh, we use them sparingly. Yeah. Um, but but there this is a function that you can have video calls with. Uh, same thing with some of the marketing that we outsource or um, any number of our consultants. But there's other things that you just cannot um, uh, uh, you know, provide remote work for. Mm -hmm. So for example, yeah. I'm traveling to uh, China tonight mm -hmm. and um, I'm visiting the factory. Right. And we rely on uh, the factory to produce product. The factory relies on employees to be available and healthy and ready to work and assemble the product. And you, you can't, you know, deliver kits of parts to people's homes yep. and expect to have right. uh, consistent output. So there, there is a, a limit uh, where uh, remote work just cannot work. Now, you know, you, if you think about, um, I, I think about like Maslow's hierarchies of needs. Mm -hmm. And so some industries are closer to the top than others. So manufacturing is right. at the bottom. But eventually there'll be a future where robots are, are are planting crops and uh, manufacturing goods mm -hmm. and um, and I think we'll all in that future will all be uh, amazing painters and po poem writers right. um, and so it'll, it's a matter of time and it's a matter of technology but uh, if you give it a hundred years 500 years yeah. I just think that um, eventually well, I suppose work will go away at the, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, right. in those periods of times. But like, it, it takes a while for certain industries to be able to espouse remote work. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so it's it's a good segue to my next question. So this is more like on a high level question right now because we've seen uh, mostly on the software side of things, right? This the rise of remote work. But again, like like you mentioned, that some uh, jobs, some occupations are just can't you cannot do that remotely. But do you think there is a um, there's an effect to that. Do you think there is a um, some kind of app where oh, a lot of things can be done remotely, and does some does it also affect the jobs that cannot be done remotely? For example, oh, do you think um, the rise of uh, remote work, you know, higher happiness or efficiency on the software side that can actually um, by proxy affects like the manufacturing side of things? Well, I think for sure if if one group of people have access to a better living standard mm -hmm. through remote work, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of one of the things my co-founder says is uh, I, w I want to enable people to work where they want and live where they right. want, right? And it's, to your point, it's easier to do that as a software engineer today sure. than it is as a, um, a, a janitor, let's mm -hmm. say. And so... Um, think of that in terms of markets. So um, if there's a big enough market for remote work in the space of janitor work, then um, somebody will come along with a solution that will enable it. So well, I'll just make something up. 
um, maybe remote control cleaning uh, surrogate robots that people can steer, uh, th that are planted into the company and people can steer that remotely, right? And so if, if, if the problem is there and the market opportunity is real, there will be a solution for it. Um, so it comes down to, to market in my mm -hmm. opinion. Um, it, it, what I would love for the world is if everybody could have all the time they they want to spend with their family and their loved ones, mm -hmm. their pets, uh, all these things that matter to them. Um, I think we'll get there. It's just it's it's going to take time. The technology is uh, ready for some industries. It's not ready for other industries. Right. But as long as there's a there's a desire for the technology for a solution, I think there'll be an entrepreneur out there that will solve the problem. Well, as you mentioned, pets is totally on red with the, all the remote break thing. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating answer. So, yeah, I think uh, for my last question for today is that now that you are not the CEO anymore, mm -hmm. so you focused on the pro product roadmap and product growth, so, uh, what's next for the meeting? What can we expect? Any potential new features or are you f will just focus on to improve the existing, existing features to near perfection? Sure. So um, for for eternity, we're going to for as long as this company exists, we're going to continue to improve mm -hmm. camera quality, speaker quality, microphone pickup performance, uh, because we've already established this meeting out line. So the first one was um, um, kind of a hypothesis that's been mm -hmm. proven to be correct, and now we need, we have an obligation to our customers to make improvements, incremental improvements, and that kind of thing. But there's other opportunities. So we talked a little bit about you know what happens before the meeting starts, what happens after mm -hmm. the meeting starts. Um, how, do, how do we take notes? How do we set agendas? How do we make sure that uh, meetings run efficiently? Um, there's problems in the meeting space that still need to be solved with whiteboarding and being able to, uh, you know, so, so there's just so many opportunities there where we are exploring um, a fair number of them. And so while you know you can rest assured that there will be newer versions of the meeting owl, um, there will also be brand new and innovative products that help you run your meetings better, start your meetings on time, capture your whiteboard content and that type of thing. And it's all going to be done through this roboticist lens, the idea that we can automate all of these things just by applying um, uh, leveraging intelligent sensors and computer vision and robotics algorithms. Mm -hmm. Okay, Max, thank you so much for your time today, and I learned a lot personally, and I hope the uh, audience uh, can also learn a thing or two from this conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had a pleasure, and I hope your audience found some of what I said useful <laughs> to them. Cheers. Cool. cool. And that's it for another episode of Outside the Valley, brought to you by ARC. We created this podcast with the hope that in each episode, you can learn something new from other remote startup people. So if you have any feedback or suggestions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at jovian at arc.dev. It's j-o-v-i-a-n at a-r-c dot d-e-v. Or you can find us on Twitter at arc.dev. See you next week with another episode of Outside the Valley, and ciao! Can you give me a charger? I was dying here. <laughs> Hi guys, this is the blooper. So we saw some episodes I have bloopers, like probably, and then like I, like, I mentioned there's...